Hello, it's me again. Today we're going to be covering the second section for the Rights and Protests Civil Rights Movement IB History Curriculum, which is Segregation and Education. In this section, we're going to be covering two specific uh, cases, which is Brown versus Board of Education and the Little Rock Nine. So again, segregation and education in the United States. Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka is a US Supreme Court decision that changed the landscape of legal support for segregation, especially racial segregation in public education. It was a paradigm shift. It overturned Plessy versus Ferguson of 1896 in the area of public education. Charles Hamilton Houston, the man who killed Jim Crow, was the leader of the NAACP and played a key role in the reversal of the legal framework that Plessy had established. The Margold Report by Nathan Ross Margold suggested attacking segregation through the courts. If we boldly challenge the constitutional validity of segregation, if and when accompanied irremediably by discrimination, we can strike directly at the most prolific sources of discrimination. Specifically, the NAACP would use the courts to challenge whether the equal part of separ separate but equal really meant equal. Shouldn't the allocation of resources for white education be equal for African American students? They transform a social issue into an economic one. The legal strategy was to set a legal precedent, which is the, to set the stage at the Supreme Court so that their legal decisions or opinions guide lower courts. They also wanted to establish judicial restraint, which was basically to tackle the reluctance to overturn long-standing precedent, precedents along with respect for the intent of legislators. What this meant is that they wanted to basically make sure that the laws that they wanted, they wanted changed were actually changed because these were these were laws that had been established for more than 50 years already. So it was really, really hard to overturn them. They also wanted to use ideological force. They wanted to strike at the core fears of segregationists. These core fears were equal status and miscegenation, which is the interbreeding of people of different races. So it was tough to actually get there because the ideology of the United States was uh, pretty conservative. And um, legally, they couldn't get there either because there were so many uh, obstacles for them. Their plan was to start with upper level institutions as they exist in racial pockets already. Donald Murray applied for admission to the University of Maryland School of Law. His application had not even been considered. His letter of application had been rejected and the fee returned. And he had been told to apply to the Princess Anne Academy the only post-secondary school available for African-Americans in Maryland. The Princess Anne Academy was at best of, uh, was the best of junior college level, but it offered no graduate co courses whatsoever and it had no law school, so there was no other way. He was also told that he could apply to an out-of-state law school, but who would give them, who would give him support? Murray becomes a plaintiff with standing no equal facility exists for his studies. And uh, Thurston, Thurwood Mar Marshall leads the case. Uh, in Murray versus Maryland of 1936, uh, it becomes a victory. Judge Eugene O'Doon decided in favor of Murray, ordering the law school to actually admit him. This is the first stage in the desegregation of, of schools in the United States. It started in colleges and it trickled down to uh, elementary schools. Chief Justice Sir Warren was a key figure during this time as well. He became appointed by President Eisenhower over the summer of 1953. Historian Richard Pluger writes that Warren had favored a sweeping civil rights program beginning with a Fair Employment Practices Act. Uh, he insisted upon one law for all men. His arguments opened the deadlock in the Supreme Court and in May 1954, it ruled unanimously that segregation by race in public schools was inherently unequal and that any language in Plessy versus Ferguson, contrary to this finding, is rejected. This led to what we call Brown II. 
Brown 2 is a Supreme Court uh, remedy. It stated that schools must be desegregated with all deliberate speed. An example is Florida, which placed the burden of desegregation on each individual student, requiring them to make a formal request to the local school board. Uh, if they were turned down, then they had to appeal to various administrative offices, and the state school board was required before a court um, to even consider a he hearing. So there, there was basically no chances for African Americans to attend school in Florida. Community, culture, facilities, enforcement mechanisms, local responsibility, and the reputation of the Supreme Court itself were now hanging by a thread. The phrase, with all deliberate speed, was an attempt to provide both flexibility and firmness, but it became justification for resistance by school districts and by states throughout the South. This is clearly seen in what we call the Southern Manifesto of the 11 former Confederate states, all but one, uh, passed laws requiring or at least allowing segregated schools. The majority of the states also provided tax dollars from being spent on desegregated schools. In 1956, 96 Southern legislators, basically most of them, signed the Southern Manifesto, pledging not to allow the segregated schools uh, publicly. And the Virginia's program of mass massive resistance, which I will explain further, uh, exemplifies the dedication of most states uh, to keeping white and African-American children separated in public schools. Federal courts held more than 200 desegregation hearings, often issuing court orders to desegregate. Uh, so again, massive resistance happens in Virginia. We're going to be talking about what happens with both governors uh, and the, uh, the tensions that, that occur between the federal government and the state. So basically, the governor of Virginia, Thomas B. Stanley, appointed a commission of 32 state, uh, state lawmakers, all white Americans, to craft a plan responding to Brown. This was called the Great Commission, and it proposed a plan with a local option that technically allowed desegregation, but its goal was to inhibit any actual desegregation at schools. The Stanley plan is put into action. Governor Stanley declared that Virginia would not permit integrated public schools within the states. And the main features of the plan included the automatic closures of any school that integrated, not those chose uh, to follow, not those that chose to follow Brown, but even schools forced to do so by federal courts. Uh, when Arlington, Virginia tried to desegregate, a call for interposition was made. This is a, a key concept. Interposition is widely discussed in the South in the pre-war civil uh, pre-Civil War period. It's basically that states could place themselves between the federal government and the citizens of the state once state officials felt the federal government had exceeded its constitutional powers. This basically meant that federalism again is taking its toll. Um, the, the, the state government is, is abusing its powers against the federal government. This is recurrent throughout the history of the civil rights movement. Again, really important key concepts, state interposition. The state puts itself between the citizens of the state, the actual, um, and the federal government. So second topic for the civil rights movement uh, in terms of education and segregation. On May 22, 1954, soon after the Brown ruling, the Little Rock School Board stated that they would comply with the Supreme Court ruling. Within months, the Arkansas branch of the NAACP, led by its president, Daisy Bates, petitioned for immediate integration of the city schools. The Blossom Plan is implemented, allowing the superintendent to choose the African-American students who would be integrated into the previously white-only schools. This basically allowed for the seg segregation to still occur. This meant minimal compliance. Um, the plan was revised to begin a token integration of high schools in 1957 and to start elementary school desegregation in 1963, again, a trickle-down effect from colleges. And the NAACP intervened, but the federal court ruled the Blossom Plan constitutional. The district's gradualism was assisted by the, by the segregated housing patterns of Little Rock. Again, in terms of those patterns, we see that uh, Section G and Section B are the uh, most uh, black 
um, populated areas, while section I is going to be the most white populated area. Uh, however, when we talk about this, the segregated schools, uh, we're going to be talking about the main one, which is located right at the center of, um, of these districts right over here. And so, of the three high schools, Horace Mann was located in the African American uh, quarter of the city. The newest high school, Hall High School, was in the wealthier Western White area, and the attendance area of Central High School, which was the which is the one that we're talking about, uh, almost uh, was mostly white. Although it did include 200 African Americans of high school age, this was later on. So what happens is that the Capitalist City, uh, Citizens Council is formed. It's called the CCC. Uh, it's formed to build support against integration. The CCC organized rallies and brought in guest speakers to promote white supremacy and demand segregation. It also sponsored a second anti-integration organization, which was called the Mother's League of Central High School, MLCHS, to provide a feminine slant to, to the effort. So basically, they wanted to, to bring in women to support uh, uh, segregation altogether. Only 20% of its membership was actual mothers from Central High School. And so not, most of the people were actually from outside of high school who were participating. What happens is that we have the Little Rock Ninth. Of the 75 to 80 applications that the school board received, uh, they identified only nine black students to attend for the 1957-1958 school year. Segregationists, including the CCC and the MLCHS, requested the, that the governor, uh, current governor Falvus, prevent implementation of the first steps of integration at Central Height, uh, citing that there, there was going to be potential violence. A request was issued to the federal government, but it was declined uh, since it was a local and state responsibility to actually enforce this segregation. The crisis reached its peak um, when the, uh, between federal versus state authority, again, federalism playing its role in this issue. Governor Falvos took action and ordered the Arkansas National Guard to Central High. Uh, to prevent violence, not by ensuring the entry of African-American students to the school, but instead by surrounding the school to prevent their entry. And so despite the governor's actions and supported by Judge Davis's order, the nine African-American students attempted to enter the, the Central High School on September 4th, 1957. They were met by an, by an angry crowd of white Americans, including both students and adults, who saw the Arkansas National Guard prohibit their entry. On September 20th, Judge Davis ordered an immediate halt to the Arkansas National Guard, uh, and they block. They they tried to block the National Guard from blocking the enrollment of African American students. Favos had to remove his troops, and on the morning of September 23rd, the nine African American students entered the Central High School uh, through a side door. An angry crowd of more than a thousand white Americans gathered, and soon the police removed the students from the school. President Eisenhower had to intervene. A governor had challenged the authority of the federal government. Again and again, we see this happening. A move that the president could not countenance. Despite appeals from the governor and other state and local officials, Eisenhower ordered 1,200 1, troops to go immediately to Little Rock. Eisenhower told the American public, whenever moral agencies prove inadequate to the task, to uphold the federal courts, the president's responsibility is inescapable. On September 25, only five days later, the Little Rock Nine were escorted into Central High School by U.S. Army soldiers. The soldiers entered the high school and the students were escorted from class to class. Eisenhower also federalized the Arkansas National Guard, removing the troops from the governor's control. And on October 1st, the U.S. Army troops were replaced by the National Guard who remain at the Central High School for the remaining Arthur school year. Uh, however, uh, Governor Faustus closed all four high schools in Little Rock the same day, a move uh, later approved by Little Rock voters, and the schools remained closed for the entire year. It wasn't until 19, the 1959-1960 the school year that supervised integration gradually continued. So we see this gradualizing, the slowly but surely of the civil rights movement, but there's a lot of retribution from uh, local uh, local citizens and also 
the state government, as well as the, the state police. Again, we have our bibliography. Thank you for uh, the work of Mark Rogers and Peter Clinton. And again, we recognize the authors of all the visual and auditory content that is added into this presentation. Thank you so much.